Hi, everyone. Uh, so glad everyone can join us. I'm really excited uh, for this stream today. My name is Rog Harshabat, and I'm with the SNAP AR uh, Developer Relations team. Uh, we're so excited today to review a really cool project that was done um, in person at a live event uh, made by an amazing team. Uh, we're going to talk a lot today about a combination of location AR and physics and interactivity. Um, it's going to be a really exciting live stream diving into a really cool project. And uh, I have the pleasure of being your host today, but more importantly, I'm here to introduce um, an amazing team. So I'm first uh, want to introduce Alex Bratt from um, the Mousepack team, as well as Michael Porter, uh, two amazing people who will be guiding us through today. Uh, so uh, why don't I pass it over to Alex who can introduce himself. Thanks, Rog. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, very excited to talk about this project. We re um, launched it about a month ago at the SNAP Partner Summit based on a physical interaction, which I'll give a, more of a rundown through. I have a presentation on that. Um, but yeah, my name is Alex Bra. I own a studio called Mousepack in New York City. And we do a lot of really fun, innovative projects, a lot of times with Snapchat. Um, I, mean, I could, uh, do we want to kick it to Mike? Yeah, why don't we, uh, Mike, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Michael Porter. Um, yeah, I'm just an independent AR creator. Um, work with Alex quite frequently. Um, he's really good. And I just like making lenses. Um, that's what I'm too fancy here. Incredible. So why don't we pass it over to Alex and why don't you uh, you kick us off? Sure thing. So I have a presentation prepared. We can uh, kick right over to that. Great. So Mousepack, what is Mousepack? Mousepack is something that I came up with uh, during the pandemic, mainly as a way for me to explore the limits of camera technology. The project all the way on the left was actually our first mouse pack project. I was still working a full-time job at doing it at night with my friends and on the weekends. Um, and it quickly became a company. So what we do a lot of times is we work on branded content for, uh, you could see some of the, the logos below that we work with. But when we're not working on branded projects, we're doing a lot of innovation. We're doing projects for us that we think are really fun and exciting because AR is such a new platform, we have the responsibility to shape it to how we want it to look. So coming up with the look, the feel, making sure that it's fun and not dystopian is the goal of Mousepack. And I work with a lot of really talented creators. Mike is uh, one of those talented creators that I work with quite frequently, as he said. Uh, I give him crazy ideas and then he makes sure that they come to life. So let's talk about the crazy idea that we're here for, it is called the Universal Gopher. What this project is, is based on a statue that uh, Snapchat made from one of my projects. Um, so I made this lens, uh, this gopher lens a long time ago. Snapchat decided to make it a physical interaction and then they wanted me to add an AR layer on top of it. So we came up with a lot of really fun ideas where people can engage with it, not only walk up to it and see some additional content, but also be able to manipulate the physics, have things, as you can see, bounce off the top of it, um, and also be able to walk up, have a toggle that you could turn on and off the gravity, switch between realities. So we really wanted to do it all. So the idea was very big and we had to refine it to something that is not only functional, but practical and that users could understand how to use. So let's get into the brief. So Snapchat came to me. I, you can see this gopher little animation. I did that back in 2017. It was just a fun little sketch that I used to draw a lot. And I thought the really big saucer eyes and the mouth was a funny combo. Uh, and I posted that. I posted that on Giphy. Has 
millions and millions of views. My uncle posted it on Facebook, didn't even know it was me. Uh, people use it a lot when they're talking about gophers. It's just a little staple on the internet for, for gophers. And I made it into a lens uh, when I was actually, I, I worked at Snapchat for a little bit and I was like, you know what, let me just try taking some of my 3D animations and putting it into AR. Um, and it did really well on Snapchat. Snapchat loved it so much, they decided to make it into a statue. At first, they were a little secret about it. They were like, just give us your gopher model. And I'm like, why? They're like, we want to keep it a secret. And this is back in 2020. Um, and then I didn't hear anything about it. And then um, a year, two years, three years go by. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, we have your gopher in a warehouse. And they send me this picture on the left. And I'm like, wow, that's, awesome they're like yeah would you like to add some ar on it and i'm like yeah sure so the idea was is that they would set up different statues around their snap partner summit and what we did is we used uh it's called um sorry uh um i'm blanking on the name custom locations um look sorry i'm blanking custom on the name but but the, there's yeah. the technology that snapchat uses that allows you to scan with a lidar enabled phone and then it GPS maps um, that data so that anyone who walks up to that physical location in that statue, it will take a photo of it, it'll scan it, it will get the geolocation locked and you can put objects on top of it. So what did we do with it is the question. We wanted to do two things. We wanted to shift between realities. This is how I start my process. I do a lot of sketches and then I do very basic mock-ups. So I took the just the picture of the gopher, and this is how I explained it to the Snap team. I said, it's gonna start in just a normal grassy field, a place that you would normally see a gopher. And then when you click a reality shift button, it would go to this sort of plane of existence that's sort of like space. It's, it's also like a weird trippy reality, um, but the gopher would have like a helmet on him and there would be a cheese moon in the background. So that was one key component of that. And that's why it's called the universal gopher. But of course, I love using physics. The physics engine in Lens Studio is so fun to use. It's so practical for so many different things. So I wanted things to bounce off the top of the gopher's head um, from a little portal that pours out. But then I wanted to make sure that the users are able to do something with that. That it's not, they're not just passively viewing it, but they're actually engaging with it as if it's a toy. So I wanted them to have the ability to turn gravity on and off. These are examples that Mike and I actually came up with while prototyping. So you can see he used this little green character here um, that wasn't part of the lens, but it was just to show you how the physics would react. So we did different types of objects. We did a rubber ducky for something that was light. We did an anvil so it can have a little more weight to it. And then we did something weird, uh, which was the box of snakes, which Michael will get into later, but that one was a lot of fun to set up. Um, the snakes have little joints in them, so they, they really react in a unique way. One thing I, I wanted to talk about is um, killing concepts, even if they're really fun and you really like them, if they're just not working. A lot of this lens was based around this controller. It was a universal controller. It was, we were thinking sort of like Rick and Morty where, um, you know, he has his portal gun and he can go into different universes. So originally we had it set up that the toggle for gravity was a big switch that goes up and down to see that visual feedback. And on that little screen there, we would see what type of interactions you're pressing. Are you doing a portal? Are you doing a reality shift? Or are you turning on the gravity? We went through a few different iterations of this. You can see we have something that looks like an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller. We have one that is directly a ripoff of the Sega Dreamcast. You can see on the bottom, just because it has that little screen on it. Um, and we pushed more towards a sort of a mix between those where it was like a more old fashioned remote. Um, but as you can see on the left there, it took up a lot of screen real estate. And that was an issue that was pointed out to us by the Snap team. They're like, hey, listen, we love this lens, but we can't see it. And at first I was like, oh man, like I spent all this time in this controller. We shopped it around. But the more I looked at it, I'm like, you know what? They're totally right. We have to come up with something way simpler, something that users can 
just quickly toggle through and understand. So I actually animated these toggles in After Effects, uh, exported them out as GIFs, and we just replaced it. So we have the little toggle for the up and down for the gravity, the little green buttons, just a very simple button to, to click to, to uh, have objects come down on the screen, and then the reality button switches between uh, the field and the space. So we got rid of the controller, but we made a better experience. So that's what I hope you take away from this is that you can kill ideas, but as long as you are doing it for the sake of making it a more streamlined experience, easier for users to understand what it is, um, that is the goal. So the thing that I we really loved, it was probably like the most um, technically um, challenging, I would say, uh, and definitely the most like out there idea was we wanted these like boxes to fall down on the snake and then when you are sorry, on the gopher's head. And then when you get close, they like launch out of the box. Like the uh, idea of the peanut can, the, the joke peanut can when you open the lid and like things fall out of them. That was sort of the idea behind it. So I challenged Mike. I said, Mike, we have these assets. We're going to rig them up with a little joint rig so that each part of their little body can move. And we have a box. Can we make it explode out of the box? And we had a lot of different ideas where like we can bake the animations or can we actually do physics? Can we do an actual simulation that shoots them out of the box, has them land on the ground and wiggle around? and then also be manipulated by the gravity the same way that the other objects would be. So that's what Mike is here to talk about today. So uh, I would love to have Mike chat about the physics behind it, and hopefully you can get some insights into how you can implement this into your projects. It's really fun, and you're welcome to hit me up on LinkedIn um, or Discord if you just type my name in. Uh, I'm sure Mike will offer the same. But we just love this stuff and we love creating fun out there ideas and really always trying to push the limits of what AR tech can do today, not just 10 years from now. All right. Um, well, you might. So yeah, so, uh, thank you, Alex, for that great intro. And yeah, I'll go over how I did the snake in the box. Uh, so this here is the snake asset that I was given. Uh, so we have the snake, uh, we have 10 segments, and there's a bone for each segment. And since this was going to be a pretty heavy lens, I did not want to work with all 10 segments. So I simplified it down to just have the five. Uh, so I doubled up these segments here. Uh, so if we rotate this, you can see that um, we have two two sections moving with the bone. Um, when I actually started working with this inside Lens Studio, um, I ran into issues because the origin of the bone uh, is right here, but the origin of the section is in the middle. Um, so one way to fix that I later discovered is I could probably just rotate the bones. But what I ended up doing is I just scrapped the rig and I just created these separate segments for the snake. Uh, so you can do this, you can keep the rig. Uh, just keep in mind that the for the ragdoll we'll be looking at, the bone origin needs to match um, your object origin, uh, just to keep things simple. Um, so yeah, so that was the first step, making sure that the snake was set up properly for the physics. Uh, and so let's head into the studio. I'll hide some of what I have and we will get uh, into it. So I'm starting with this simple scene. Um, I just have a sphere here as a stand for the gopher. Uh, the actual project is pretty heavy for Lin Studio. Uh, and then for the ground, I'm not using a plane. I discovered with the physics, it's better to use a box. Otherwise, sometimes you can get something that falls through and it keeps going. Uh, so let's go ahead and create our rag doll. Uh, which is kind of fun to make. So I start with just like a scene object. Uh, so I'll call this snake ragdoll. I'll just keep everything organized. And the first thing that we want to do is um, recreate the snake with um, 
boxes, or you could use a capsule. Uh, this is just a little easier to visualize. So we're going to create, recreate the snake and then match it up with the actual snake. So let's bring the snake in so we can see it. And let's scale it down a little bit. All right, so here's our snake and we're gonna position our first box. Now let's do it up by the head. See, it froze for a second. Here we go. So what I want to do is I just want to and scale this down. And we don't need to be exact. We just want to roughly match the dimensions. And then we're going to add a physics component or physics body. Um, shape, I'm just going to keep this box to keep things simple. And then you can go ahead and hide that render mesh visual. We have our little box here. Uh, since we have that, we can just duplicate it. Slide over and just kind of rinse and repeat. I just want to make sure it's roughly. So like dimensions. each one of these boxes is what will interact with the floor. Is that correct? It's sort of the container. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We're going to use these um, for physics and then match our snake to it. Exactly. Thank you. So we'll just do more and we have our snake pretty much done. And then if we were to, um, I'm going to select these and let's show the collider. Uh, when I reset the lens, you can see, it's a little hard to see, but you can see the little outlines right there. Let's turn these back on really quick. So you can see they fall down. And if I move this over the sphere in the middle, you can see that they go all over the place. That's not what we want. Uh, we want to keep this all connected. Uh, so you just select each one. You're going to open up your physics body, add a constraint. And we want a hinge. You want to rotate that so it's vertical. And then we can drag that over. So it's right in the middle. And our target is going to be the next box over. So this is box one. We want to track box two. Now when we replay, you can see that they are staying connected. And it's kind of flat right now. So if we slide it so it's not exactly over, when it falls, you can see we get some rotation there. And you can adjust the size of the box to adjust how much it rotates. Now, so let's just add these really quick. Inch rotates 90 degrees. Oh, now we want to select our target. Box three. Now, so this part's a little repetitive to set up, but we're going to end up with some really good results. We want box four. And then how loose this is, is just you adjust the space in between the box so that it has a little more like wiggle room. So right now, because boxes are so close together, it's going to be a pretty tight, but that's very easy to adjust. And we want to target box five. Now, if we reset to our lens, you can see we have this rag doll here with these boxes. Oh. So it falls down, hits that, and kind of flops around. Uh, so let's go ahead and hide our boxes again. And now we want the snake to actually track to that. And so there is a template that another creator created. I forgot who it was, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's kind of like this underwater scene with seaweed kind of flowing and there are fish swimming and it moves the seaweed out of the way. And there is a script in there 
that will track objects um, like the bones of a mesh or any object to a physics object. So we're going to bring in that script. It says bones target colliders. Uh, so our trackers are going to be these physics objects. So we have five total. And then we're going to have our snake section here. So let's drag these over one by one. So you need to be that. So let's bring box. Two. Box three. Box four. Box five. And then we have our snake pieces. And so this is going to track each segment of the snake to those physics objects. And I can see that our snake falls and it flops around with each of those objects. So this is the easy part, just creating that ragdoll. Um, it's a little bit of manual work, but pretty doable. Um, so the next tricky part was the box, because um, we wanted it to follow the physics, but you can see that it has a, a top and actually has an animation. So we can play it and the lid pops open. And so when the snake pops out, um, you want the box to be able to open. It needs to be facing the right way uh, so the snake can come out. Um, the problem with the physics system is you can't control how it lands. And if you bake the animation, then it's not participating in the physics fully and it's always going to land in the same spot. So uh, what I did was I kind of modified the same idea that we used for the snake ragdoll. Uh, I created a separate physics just for the box. And you can see that they are not aligned fully right here. Uh, that is because of the, the origin of, of my mesh. So I had to adjust the rig. Um, so it looks bad here, but over here um, it will line up. And so you can see that we have our physics box bouncing around but our box is just static. Um, so we're going to jump into a little bit of scripting to kind of go over what we did. Um, so before that, actually, one other key are these tweens. Um, so the overview of how we solved this is uh, we have the box follow our physics box. Once we get close, we're going to stop following the physics box uh, we're going to use some tweens to bounce it up, rotate it to be the right way, then turn the physics back on. Uh, so that's what this bounce and the rotate is. Uh, so the rotate, um, so it's a tween, the type is rotate. And instead of the default from two, I'm just giving an angle to rotate two. So we calculate, so calculate this in the script. Uh, we figure out what angle the box should be. It rotates that way. And so that it doesn't look weird. We bounce it up in the air while it rotates. Uh, so it's a little more fluid. Uh, so let's look at a little bit of scripting. Nothing too crazy. Uh, so our physics box is that actual physics body. This is our box we want to track to it. And then we have our camera distance trigger and then the snakes to enable. Uh, so we just have some setup. We're getting the transforms. And this here, flip box, this is where the magic happens. Uh, so we get our current Y angle. So if we have, think of my hands as the box. So we have the X, Y, and Z rotations. If our box is angled this way around the Y, that's okay. We don't need to fix that. So we're going to go and save that. Uh, but we want the X and the Z angles to reset to zero. So the box is upright, but we can be twisted around. Uh, so that's what we do here. Uh, so that's this new angle. And then on the tween, we just say, hey, set that angle to our end value for the tween. And it will automatically rotate to how we want it. Uh, so that part is actually super simple um, once you kind of get those angles figured out. Then we also get our current position in the world uh, because we don't want the box moving around. We want to just bounce up and down. Um, so we get our current position. We add a little offset so it bounces up and then we set those values on the tween and then we start the tween. And then once it's done bouncing up, 
we can play our animation. So we get the animation mixer, we play that open animation, and then we go through and we enable the snakes, which in the final ones, they have a behavior script, which adds some upward velocity, so they shoot out. Uh, so that's how we get them to bounce out. Uh, we enable it, they bounce out. And then this physics delay, uh, if we remember, we have that physics object tracked to the box. If we spawn the snake and it gets and it overlaps with the physics body, it's not going anywhere. So we actually disable the physics object, shoot the snakes out, re-enable the physics object, so then the snakes can bounce off. So lots of little tiny steps kind of make it all work right. Um, so yeah, so then what we're doing is if we should follow the physics object, we just take our box, it follows a physics object, and then when it's doing the balance between, we actually reverse it because if the box is by another object, we want it to still knock the object out of the way. So we have our physics objects now track our box. Uh, and then, yeah, we just have a little distance check. Um, we have some conditions. We want to make sure that the box has stopped moving. We don't want it to also stop midair and start bouncing around. Uh, so we just have these different conditions to make sure that it's initialized, it's moved, and now it's stopped. And so if we turn that on, I have it called the box controller. So let's back up from our box and reset the lens. So you can see it falls down and it opens up and our snake pops out. Now it's great to let the finished lens because we have some physics we need to play around with still. So, uh, but that's the gist of that. Uh, so our box uh, fully participates in the physics system, interacts with anything around it, but when we want it to pop open, we make sure it's always going to be the right orientation. We get enough, it writes itself and opens, snake comes out, and we have those ragdoll physics happening. Uh, so this was fun to figure out. When Alex asked if I could do it, I said sure, and then I'd never actually used a physics system before, so this was fun. I didn't tell him that part. <laughs> um, but yeah, it all, all worked out in the end, um, just kind of like selectively using the features of Win Studio as we needed them. Yeah, that was definitely, um, we weren't sure if it was gonna happen. Uh, I think that's kind of the fun part about innovative technology is that we come up with ideas and we always have a plan B like mentioned, like there is a way to bake the animations, meaning we do the keyframes within a program like Blender, Cinema 4D, Maya, and then just have it play out that way. So that was our backup plan the whole time. But because Mike is a wizard and he loves challenges, um, figuring out the, the physics engine is, is a really fun tool. It's a really fun toy. Uh, being able to put the constraints around boxes, you can do that for an unlimited amount of things. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really cool feature once you start kind of figuring out what you can, can't do, what the limitations are, so you can find your way around the limitations. Um, so yeah, if if we have some more time, I can show a little bit about the transition between the different worlds. Is that? Yeah, I think we have time. Okay. We have um, about twenty five minutes, so. Oh, sweet. So we can get really dry and boring if we want. Yeah. All right. So there are different ways to do this. Um, I like to use render targets a lot. Um, so each camp has layers it can see and it outputs everything to a render target. Uh, so usually people don't mess with these, but you can add layers, you can add render targets. Um, and then you can actually have objects that are shared between these. Uh, so we're going to make something really simple. Um, let's add a sphere and we want this to be, just call it the sphere world. So we're going to stick it on a new layer, call this sphere world. And let's add maybe some from the asset library. Three and 
Who's that panda? I like to use that. All the way at the bottom. Here we go. So we'll import this panda and we'll have a panda world. All right, so this is coming in. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have separate cameras, separate layers, separate render targets. Um, I like to keep things as separate as possible until the very last minutes to kind of combine things. Um, and so also a little extra trick, um, we have our world tracking on this camera because it's for a custom land marker we need to, be able to move around. Um, our other cameras also need to track, but instead of adding tracking components, we can just add them underneath this camera and they essentially inherit that tracking. So let's close the asset library. And this is going to be a little bit of setup, but a really cool end result. Let's see what I was thinking. Let's pause this to help it out. Let's try that again. The stream's been causing that a little trouble. Okay. So we're going to call this the sphere camera. We can call this the panda camera. Yeah, we want to make sure that their positions are zeroed. We want them to be right under this camera. That out. And a little more boilerplate. Uh, we need a couple targets. Let's call this sphere target. And we'll copy that to Duplicate, we want to rename Panda Target. Okay, so let's first look at our. Let's change our live target to the sphere target. Let's turn this preview back on. So, our sphere camera, we only want to look at the sphere world, not the default layer. Um, actually, let's go ahead and do the default layer and shared objects. We'll give our box and stuff there. And we will output to the sphere target. And so we should be able to see our box and we should see this other sphere. So let's move our sphere so it's not on our camera. All right, so here is our sphere. And let's add that panda as well, and we'll make sure we can't see that here. Uh, we want to have these kind of different worlds, different settings. So our panda is on the default layer, so it's the shared one. So let's give it its own layer. We'll call this panda world. And there we go. So we have our sphere world. Now our panda camera, same thing. We want to see default layer. The panda layer will output to the panda render target. Now if we switch this in our live target, our sphere will disappear and the panda will be there. Uh, so this is the basic gist of the buffer lens. We had the grass world, the space world. Now uh, we needed our objects visible in both, but then we had some extra elements for each one. Uh, and you can see that we can move around and our objects are still tracked. Uh, so to actually kind of use this, um, we make, uh, let's add a screen image. We're going to do this transition in 2D. And I like to call this comp, or I guess comp because I can't spell. 
it's our live target now we'll switch to our comp orthographic camera we'll also put to the comp all right so we can't see anything right now uh, so we can pull in our different worlds so we have our sphere worlds um, but this is boring we want to transition so we're going to use a custom material uh, to kind of control that. We can use a tween. Uh, we're just going to have a slider so we can use a script or tween or whatever to control it. Um, yeah, it froze up again. Sometimes one studio needs just a minute. Here we go. Um, so we'll just grab the omelet. So what did you just delete there, Mike? Um, I think the unlit material has. Um, I could just create an empty material. I just usually grab unlit just because it has beta capacity. But this question, we want to start from scratch. So I'm going to add a, a couple texture 2D nodes to pull in our separate render targets. Parameter. So this first one is, I can give it a nice name. I call this sphere. I call this one panda. I'm going to mix them together. So you can start to do some like fancy things as far as how you transition. Um, but we're just going to keep this simple and use a float parameter. And connect that to the ratio. And so the slope parameter, uh, let's call this mix. We do need to set the script name because if we want to use this elsewhere, we'll enable a man in the max because uh, the mix can only go between zero and one. Uh, so there's that. So let's stick our material on the screen image. Just going to set that there. Now we can select our material. Oh, I'm in the wrong material. Hold on. Copy and paste. Make sure you're in the right material before you do anything. There we go. Uh, so now we should get the updated stuff here. Sphere, Panda. And so here's our scene. And now we can drag the slider. And you can see we can mix between the two uh, scenes. So that's the basic gist of the gopher lens. Um, we control it via script. Uh, so let's go ahead and just add a tween. Uh, we'll do a tween value. And it'll be a float. Let's go ahead and ping pong. 
We're gonna start at zero, go up to one. Let's take three seconds. And our update will be a material parameter. Our material is that unlit. The name of our parameter is mix. That's the name we gave. And now, once this resets, it will start um, mixing between the two scenes. Let's just change the screen here so it's smooth. I think I have this right. Let's check the logger. Oh, there we go. I copied it, so I have to fix the name. Let's call it Mixy, I think. Make that unique. Doing this live is fun. There we go. Now it works. Uh, so that's just kind of like the basic world transition. Um, a lot of setup for the payoff, but yeah, separate cameras, layers, run your targets, and then, yeah, you can have your shared items and then your unique items. Uh, so you have that distinct look however you want. Awesome. Yeah, and I can yeah. I can share my screen again to show uh, sort of some behind the scenes uh, or, or what it looks like in the, the final version of it, because what Mike did was really cool is that he did this not only with um, objects but materials he added a stroke around all of the characters to make them look like they're in a cartoon world he also made uh he replaced the sky in in the background so it's it's more of an immersive environment so it was sort of like switching between ar and vr so there was a lot set up with this switch uh so once he had the functionality set up pretty much it was sky's the limit Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Those examples will be better than my rambled words. I think it's super helpful. I'm glad we were able to talk through that. Yeah. If, if, if we'd like, we can switch back to uh, my screen and I can show the, the final result just to kind of bring it all together. So what Mike shared was obviously putting the rigid bodies on all of these little objects here, having them come down and interact with the LiDAR mesh, which had its own body, the box of snakes that writes itself and can interact with the objects, and being able to switch, turn off the gravity, have things flow up in the air, switch between realities, switch back, and having all of that control um, was just, it was a really fun project. We, we definitely did as much as we could and it fit within the lens. The eight megabyte limit is a lot, but putting all of the code, all of the assets, everything in there, uh, it was nice and tight right at that limit. But yeah, so huge shout out to Mike for bringing this dream together. If you want to see more of breakdowns, we have breakdowns on mousepack.com. There's case studies, but there's also video case studies so you can watch some more behind the scenes on this project. Yeah, so amazing. Um, play, we can uh, get my face back on, but a really, um, a really an amazing tutorial. I, I think we, we talked about a lot of really cool ways that you can go through lenses using physics, using interactivity, uh, blending some interesting things. But I think one of the most exciting things that you all covered is just like how you can go into something not knowing exactly how you're going to do it and, and find your way, right? And, and how the idea can be king. But you also mentioned backups being so important to that, which I think goes into like how you think about um, making sure you get to the end with the project that you need, right? Uh, which I think is important. Yeah, if you pitch something to a client, you kind of need to make sure that it happens because oh, yeah. they're planning on it. So having that plan B is always important. 
when you're presenting ideas, there's always the sky's the limit version, if you can figure it out, and then the grounded in reality, maybe not as impressive, but just a way to make sure that your project gets finished how you pitched it. Incredible. Well, yeah, really thank you to Alex and Mike for, I think, what was a really um, good granular stream on some really good techniques. Uh, I think uh, this lens is just such a great example of so many different things. Um, really appreciate everyone in the audience who joined for this session. I think we were able to see a lot here. Um, my recommendation, if you want more, is you can visit the YouTube channel that you're on uh, or at Snap AR and see other previous live streams. Um, there is actually going to be our next live stream, uh, I believe on July 18th about creating AR experiences for city scale, which is another really amazing feature. Uh, so feel free to pay attention to the live stream schedule on the Snap Our YouTube account to see what's coming up. Um, and we also feel free to follow the Discord and find the Snap Air Discord, where you can continue to interact with a lot of creators and, and developers and, and learn more. Um, so what an exceptional session. Um, and also, uh, and want to keep in plugging that there, we have a lot of new learning resources under new learning management system at snap.com slash learn. So please check that out because if you're looking to get started, there's no better time than now. You've not made a lot of lenses. Uh, the learn portal is going to teach you and take you through a lot of these beginning tutorials that is going to be mind blowing and, and you'll be making experiences like this in no time. So, um, Really amazing uh, time today. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone who helped put the stream together uh, and appreciate everyone who joined us. Uh, so uh, we're going to close this out, but feel free to find more resources online. And, uh, and thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.